volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 27 The Epileptic Now when the prayer was ended, I turned my back upon the lightening east and set off along the lane. But as I went, I heard one hailing me, and glancing round, saw that in the hedge was a wicket gate, and over this gate a man was leaning, a little thin man with the face of an ascetic or a medieval saint, a face of a high and noble beauty, upon whose scholarly brow sat a calm serenity, yet beneath which glowed the full bright eye of the man of action. "'Good morning, friend,' said B. "'Welcome to my solitude. I wish you joy of this new day of ours. It is cloudy yet, but there is a rift down on the horizon. It will be a fair day, I think.' "'On the contrary, sir,' said I, "'to me there are all evidences of the bad weather continuing. I think it will be a bad day, with rain, and probably thunder and lightning. Good morning, sir.' "'Stay!' cried he, as I turned away, and with the word set his hand upon the gate, and vaulting nimbly over came toward me, with a broad-brimmed straw hat in one hand, and a long-stemmed wooden pipe in the other. "'Sir,' said he, "'my cottage is close by. You look worn and jaded. Will you not step in and rest a while? "'Thank you, sir, but I must be upon my way.' "'And whither lies your way?' "'To Sissinghurst, sir.' "'You have a long walk before you.' and, with your permission, I will accompany you a little way. "'With pleasure, sir,' I answered, "'though I fear you will find me a moody companion, and somewhat silent one. But then I shall be the better listener, so light your pipe, sir, and while you smoke, talk.' "'My pipe,' said he, glancing down at it. "'Ah! Yes, I was about to compose my Sunday evening's sermon. You are a clergyman, sir?' "'No, no, a preacher, or, say, rather, a teacher.' and a very humble one who, striving himself after truth, seeks to lend such aid to others as he may. Truth, said I, what is truth? Truth, sir, is that which can never pass away. The truth of life is good works which abide everlastingly. Sir, said I, you smoke a pipe, I perceive, and should therefore be a good preacher, for smoking begets thought. And yet, sir, is not to act greater than to think? Why? "'Thought far outstrips puny action,' said I. "'It reaches deeper, soars higher. "'In our actions we are pygmies, "'but in our thoughts we may be gods "'and embrace a universe. "'But,' sighed the preacher, "'while we think, our fellows perish in ignorance and want. "'Huh!' said I. "'Thought,' pursued the preacher, "'may become a vice, as it did with the old-time monks and hermits, "'who, shutting themselves away from their kind, "'wasted their lives upon their knees.' thinking noble thoughts, and dreaming of holy things, but leaving the world very carefully to the devil. And as to smoking, I am seriously considering giving it up. Here he took the pipe from his lips and thrust it behind his back. Why? It has become, unfortunately, too human. It is a strange thing, sir, he went on, smiling and shaking his head, that this, my one indulgence, should breed me more discredit than all the cardinal sins, and become a stumbling-block to others. Only last Sunday I happened to overhear two white-headed old fellows talking. A fine sermon, Giles, said the one. Ah, good enough, replied the other, but it might have been better, you see, he smokes. So I am seriously thinking of giving it up for it would appear that if a preacher prove himself as human as his flock, they immediately lose faith in him and become deaf to his teaching. "'Very true, sir,' I nodded. "'It has always been human to admire and respect that only which is in any way different to ourselves. In archaic times, those whose teachings were above men's comprehension, or who were remarkable for any singularity of action, were immediately deified.' Pythagoras recognized this truth when he shrouded himself in mystery, and delivered his lectures from behind a curtain, though to be sure he has become regarded as something of a charlatan in consequence. "'Pray, sir,' said the preacher, absent-mindedly puffing his pipe again, "'may I ask what you are?' "'A blacksmith, sir.' "'And where did you read of Pythagoras and the like?' "'At Oxford, sir.' How comes it, then, that I find you in the dawn, wet with rain, buffeted by wind, and, most of all, a shewer of horses? But instead of answering, I pointed to a twisted figure that lay beneath the opposite hedge. A man, exclaimed the preacher, and asleep, I think. No, said I, not in that contorted attitude. 
"'Indeed you are right,' said the preacher. "'The man is ill, poor fellow.' And hurrying forward, he fell on his knees beside the prostrate figure. He was a tall man, roughly clad, and he lay upon his back, rigid and motionless, while upon his blue lips were flecks and bubbles of foam. "'Epilepsy,' said I. The preacher nodded, and busied himself with loosening the sodden neckcloth, while I unclasped the icy fingers to relieve the tension of the muscles. The man's hair was long and matted, as was also his beard, and his face all drawn and pale and very deeply lined. Now as I looked at him I had a vague idea that I had somewhere, at some time, seen him before. "'Sir,' said the preacher, looking up, "'will you help me to carry him to my cottage? It is not very far.' So we presently took the man's wasted form between us, and bore it easily enough to where stood a small cottage, bowered in roses and honeysuckle. And having deposited our unconscious burden upon the preacher's humble bed, I turned to depart. Sir, said the preacher, holding out his hand, it is seldom one meets with a blacksmith who has read the Pythagorean philosophy at Oxford, and I should like to see you again. I am a lonely man, save for my books. Come and sup with me some evening, and let us talk. "'And smoke?' said I. The little preacher sighed. "'I will come,' said I. "'Thank you, and good-bye.' Now even as I spoke, chancing to cast my eyes upon the pale, still face on the bed, I felt more certain than ever that I had somewhere seen it before. CHAPTER Twenty Eight, IN WHICH I COME TO A DETERMINATION As I walked through the fresh green world there ensued within me the following dispute, as it were, between myself and two voices. The first voice I will call pro, and the other contra. Myself. May the devil take that gabbing dick. Pro. He probably will. Myself. Had he not told me of what he saw, of the man who looked at my Virgil over her shoulder? Pro. Or had you not listened? Myself. Ah, yes, but then I did listen, and that he spoke the truth is beyond all doubt. The misplaced Virgil proves that. However, it is certain, yes, very certain, that I can remain no longer in the hollow. Contra. Well, there is excellent accommodation at the bull. Pro. And pray, why leave the hollow? Myself. Because she is a woman. Pro. And you love her? Myself. To my sorrow. Pro. Well, but woman was made for man, Peter, and man for woman. Myself. Sternly. Enough of that. I must go. Pro. Being full of bitter jealousy. Myself, no. Pro, being a mad, jealous fool. Myself, as you will. Pro, who has condemned her unheard with no chance of justification. Myself, tomorrow at the very latest I shall seek some other habitation. Pro, has she the look of guilt? Myself, no. But then women are deceitful by nature, and very skillful in disguising their faults. At least so I have read in my books. Pro, contemptuously, books, books, books. Myself, shortly, no matter, I have decided. Pro, do you remember how willingly she worked for you with those slender, capable hands of hers? Myself, why remind me of this? Pro, you must needs miss her presence sorely, her footstep that was always so quick and light. Myself, truly wonderful in one so nobly formed. Pro, in the way she had of singing softly to herself. Myself, a beautiful voice. Pro, with a caress in it, and then her habit of looking at you over her shoulder. Myself, ah, yes, her lashes a little drooping, her brow a little wrinkled, her lips a little parted. Contra, a comfortable inn is the bull. Myself, hastily, yes, yes, certainly. Pro, ah, her lips, the scarlet witchery of her lips, do you remember how sweetly the lower one curved upward to its fellow, a mutinous mouth with its sudden bewildering changes? You never quite knew which to watch oftenest, her eyes or her lips. Contra, hoarsely, excellent cooking at the bowl. Pro, and how she would berate you and scoff at your master Epictetus and dry-as-dust philosophers. Myself, I have sometimes wondered at her pronounced antipathy to Epictetus. Pro, and she called you a creature. Myself, the meaning of which I never quite fathomed. Pro, and frequently a pedant. Myself, I think not more than four times. Pro, 
On such occasions, you will remember, she had a petulant way of twitching her shoulder towards you and frowning, and occasionally stamping her foot. And deep within you, you loved it all, you know you did. Contra. But that is all over, and you are going to the bull. Myself. Hurriedly. To be sure. The bull. Pro. And lastly, you cannot have forgotten, you never will forget, the soft tumult of the tender bosom that pillowed your battered head, the pity of her hands, those great scalding tears, the sudden swift caress of her lips, and the thrill of her voice when she said, myself hastily, stop, that is all forgotten. Pro, you lie, you have dreamed of it ever since, working at your anvil or lying upon your bed, with your eyes upon the stars, you have loved her from the beginning of things myself. And I did not know it. I was very blind. The wonder is that she did not discover my love for her long ago. For not knowing it was there, how should I try to hide it? Contra. Oh, blind, and more than blind, why should you suppose she hasn't? Myself, stopping short. What? Can it be possible that she has? Contra. Didn't she once say that she could read you like a book? Myself. She did. Contra. And have you not often surprised a smile upon her lips, and wondered? Myself. Many times. Contra. Have you not beheld a thin-veiled mockery in her look? Why, poor fool, has she not mocked you from the first? You dream of her lips, were not their smiles but coquetry and derision. Myself. But why should she deride me? Contra. For your youth and innocence. Myself. My youth, my innocence. Contra, being a fool in grain, didn't you boast that you had known but few women? Myself, I did, but... Contra, didn't she call you boy, 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 and laugh at you? Myself, well, even so. Contra, with bitter scorn. Oh, boy, oh, innocent of the innocent. Go to for a bookish fool. Learn that lovely ladies yield themselves but to those who are masterful in their wooing, who have wooed often and triumphed as often. O oh, innocent of the innocent! Forget the maudlin sentiment of thy books and old romances, thy pure Sir Galahads, thy, quote, very parfait, gentil knights, unquote, thy meek and lowly lovers, serving their ladies on bended knee. Open thine eyes, learn that women to-day love only the strong hand, the bold eye, the ready tongue. Kneel to her, and she will scorn and contemn you. What woman, think you, would prefer the solemn, stern-eyed purity of a Sir Galahad, though he be the king of men, to the quick-witted gaiety of a debonair Lothario, though he be but the shadow of a man? Out upon thee, pale-faced student! Thy tongue hath not the trick, nor thy mind the nimbleness for the winning of a fair and lovely lady. Thou art well enough in want of a better— but when Lothario comes, must she not run to meet him with arms outstretched? To-morrow, said I, clenching my fists, to-morrow I will go away. Being now come to the hollow, I turned aside to the brook at that place where was the pool, in which I was wont to perform my morning ablutions, and kneeling down I gazed at myself in the dark, still water, and I saw that the night had indeed set its mark upon me. To-morrow, said I again, nodding to the wild face below. To-morrow I will go far hence. Now while I yet gazed at myself, I heard a sudden gasp behind me, and turning, beheld Charmian. Peter, is it you? she whispered, drawing back from me. Who else, Charmian? Did I startle you? Yes, oh, Peter, are you afraid of me? You are like one who has walked with death. I rose to my feet and stood looking down at her. Are you afraid of me, Charmian? No, Peter. I am glad of that, said I, because I want to ask you to marry me, Charmian. End of In Which I Come to a Determination <laughs>